to the New Sizi Archives Heritage Room. I'm Sister Seal Struck and I am the archivist. I welcome you to our Chinese display, The Kingdom Come in China. 85 years ago, last year, we sent four of our sisters as missionaries to China. And the story that I have in the next room, in our display room, tells that story of, of when, even before the four were chosen, what our community and especially Mother General and the, her council all did and discussed before sending those four off to China. There's an interesting story about the banner here. It was one of the cover pages in one of our directories before they got into stories from all the different missions. And this image here was a Japanese woman. And when I was showing Sister Eugenio, one of the sisters from China, the image, she got so upset because she said, that's Japanese, that's not Chinese. So I felt if I was really going to honor them, I had to change the Japanese image to a Chinese woman and child. We have now entered the, the display room of the Sisters of St. Francis, and Sister Adele Thibodeau, our vocation director, has joined me. We're going to walk through the different stages that our community and the sisters who first were sent to China um, kind of had to go step through themselves. Our first step here is the call, and back in 1926, Pope Pius XI declared of the things of the church, which primarily talked about Catholic missions. Shortly after that, we had two OFMs, a brother and a father, come to the, the mother house requesting Sister Celestine, our mother general, and her council to consider sending sisters over to to China as missionaries. At that point, money was an issue, um, and pretty much that was put on the back burner. Then in 1926, again, we were approached by another Franciscan priest who was looking for a community, once again, to send sisters over to China to help in their missions. Then in 1928, Father Alphonse comes knocking at the door to talk to, again, Mother Celestine and the Council. And he was told to come to us from one of our sisters who was in Houghton, Iowa. And she said, I, you need to go to our mother house in Milwaukee and talk to Mother Celestine. And he did. And with that, it was seen to be more positive sense in the sense that I'm sure money was still a problem but there was more openness to really seriously consider sending our sisters to China. But back in 1926, when we were first approached, Mother Celestine sent out what was called a circular letter requesting sisters, um, if you are interested in becoming a missionary, to write to, uh, to, write to me, to write to the council, um, stating your interest. And at that time, a good number of letters arrived. And one of the sisters that eventually was chosen had written in 1926, and again in 1928, this is what she wrote. This is March 5th, 1928. Praise be Jesus Christ, venerable and dear mother. In answer to your circular letter, I wish to state again that it is still my constant and most earnest desire to be a foreign missionary. I do not claim to possess the virtues specified but with God's grace and a good will, everything is possible. So I hope you will still consider me to be always, or at any time, eagerly awaiting the call. Gratefully yours, Sister Mary Reginald. And Sister Reginald is one of the four sisters in our first group that went to China. April of 1928, this huge meeting took place where the decision was finally made. More planning was going to have to take place, but finally a definite yes was said. When the final okay came for them to establish a mission in China, there was a lot of groundwork that had to be done. One was getting permission from the U.S. Department of Labor and having St. Mary's Academy High School 
becoming a place where the, the Chinese young women would be educated. So that permission was granted. They also had, um, again, the money was an issue, so they had to seek out funds. And one was to um, the Missionary Association of Catholic Women here in Milwaukee. They were approached, and again, they said yes to funding our first four sisters to China. Still, I understand that even children out on the missions got involved. How in the world did they do that? Mother Celestine called for a penny drive, and again, the sisters took up the call. The pennies weren't sent in, but apparently the amount of money that was collected was astounding. Um, it said if all the returns had been sent in pennies, there would literally have been heaps and heaps of pennies. So again, we don't know what that equaled. No, I, I take it back. $1,437.87. So that's the amount of pennies that, that was collected over, I don't know how long of a time. Um, right here, Palm Sunday, 1920s, when she called out for that penny drive to take place. And I also know we had many, many grade schools at that time. Yes, so we did. This was very yeah. smart. Well, over $1,000 a penny, that's a lot. <laughs> so while that was taking place, they were also gathering items to ship over to China. One of our workmen, built the wooden crates for that to take place. Um, they also had uh, Chinese dinner before they left um, America. And when it came to departure day, it was a huge celebration. I know I uh, picked up some of the letters there and some of the accounts of the different uh, talks that were given to send them off. And I couldn't help but think how what short um, spans of interest we have in anything. And these were talks that went on, I'm sure, for a half hour, 45 minutes, in very elaborate language of praise and gratitude. Mm -hmm. And there were at least three or four on that, that weekend. Right. It was amazing right. to me. So August 19th, 1929, was the first group that left for China. And they call them generations. So from 1929, the last two sisters that went over were 1940. They were the sixth generation. So we had a number of them go over. Um, some wanted to come back. Some would have stayed there for the rest of their life. And the interesting thing is their belief was that once they left the mother house, they would never, ever, ever return back to the States. They figured they would die in China um, and most likely become martyrs. That did not take place. They were able to come back to the States, but that was their belief at the time, that once they left, that, that would be the end of seeing mother house, community, family, even our country. Um, An interest of mine is, of course, history, but Whenever I come across a group that is traveling from one place to the other, I also need to see it because of being a visual learner. So I have a map here of the, of the world where I trace their um, travels from Milwaukee, Wisconsin to China. And they went to the province of Shandong. And the first stop was at Xianfu. And then they finally established a mission, their mission in Hankailu. So that kind of gives an idea of the length of time and just what they experienced in traveling, because it certainly wasn't hopping on a plane and being over there within a matter of a day's time. One interesting and I, hilarious story that I found was Sister Reginald, two of them went on, on decks of the ship. And a typhoon was happening. And she and this other sister wanted to see what a typhoon looked like. Now, so they found themselves a little cubby, and there were other passengers on it. So they got to see the typhoon, but as soon as a huge wave came and drenched them, they all ran down into you know, where there was shelter. Um, I think since Sister Reginald would have been a character to get to know. I didn't have the opportunity, but I would love to get to meet her in, in that. Then here we have uh, their life in Hankailu. Again, very primitive to what we know today. They did have an order of the day. Um, they did build 
Our Lady of the Angels. They were teaching primarily women at that time, and these women would be virgins who were then educated and sent out to help the missionary priests in, in various areas. Besides their day-to-day -day tasks, they also were concerned about the government situation um, around themselves. China had many conflicts. They had the communists versus the nationalists. They had to worry about bandits. Then Japanese overtook China and they still could teach, they still could do what they needed to do, but again they never knew when they would be told to leave or when they could maybe be under house arrest, so it was always an iffy thing. One story is that the Japanese commander came to their convent and wanted to take all the possessions out. And the sister in charge said, but our property belongs to the church. If you want to take it, you need to get permission from the Pope. So he kind of argued then, he said, and she said, sorry, it, our property belongs to the church. We don't have any right to give it to you because it doesn't belong to us. So he went away. That's a good one. Well, I have a little story that I picked up from Sister Elaine Labonte, and I see now that she came to China in 1940. And her story was that the Chinese sisters were going to be making uh, their perpetual vows, and we signify that by our gold ring. And so they had sewed many gold rings into the many pleats in her woolen habit, if you can imagine. And she said she was sitting up on the deck, and every time the Japanese soldiers would walk by very solemnly, she could just feel herself jump, lest she be discovered to be carrying these gold rings. Wow, well, that's neat. I think it's pretty <laughs> They got scary. around. I mean, that whole story with, you know, our property belongs to the Pope. Yes. And they knew, somehow they knew what had to be done. Well, the day came when the Japanese did come knocking and they were sent to an internment camp. And the Chinese sisters were left behind to take care of all the missions, to continue the teaching, the cooking, um, the gardening, and so on. And all Americans, well, all foreign missionaries were sent to an internment camp. They spent two, two and a half years there. Um, Every day it seemed like, or every few days, it seemed like the sisters saw more foreign missionaries coming into the camp. The, the camp was a former, I believe, Protestant um, mission. And the Japanese took it over and that became the internment camp. So it wasn't in the best condition. Uh, things had to be cleaned out and cleared out. and. What room is going to, what building is going to be in the hospital, what buildings are going to be used for housing, where are you going to have the kitchen, and so on. So a lot of planning was done, but in the internment camp, they did set up all these committees who would take care of the day-to-day -day living, so there was peace and order in that internment camp. Okay. In doing, again, the research on the internet, I found paintings that Gertrude Wilder did when she was also in that same internment camp. So this gives you an idea of what that once mission looked like that the Protestants had. Also we have some of the patches that were worn by the sisters while in camp. We also have a meal card, so they were being kept track of in many different ways. They had a special passes, again, those are down below. One sad note is Sister Reginald was one of the sisters in the internment camp and she needed an operation and she said if I have it now while I'm in camp, once we are freed I can go right back to our mission. So she had the surgery, complications took um, over and she died while in the internment camp. The sisters did receive permission to carry her body back to Hankailu and she's buried on once what once was our property in Hong Kai Lu. And we do have a chip of her gravestone as a remembrance. So that's a one sad note from the internment camp. In the internment camp at one point, 
the Japanese were willing to do an exchange of prisoners. So we had three of our sisters released quite early, maybe five, six months after they were interned, and they did manage to be exchanged on a ship uh, near Pakistan um, at that point, and then they returned to America. The other sisters decided that they would just wait, wait it out. Three of our sisters were under house arrest in, I believe it was Peking. They were in a convent, so my guess is their life was a little bit better than, than this internment camp. But because one of the sisters had an eye infection, she was sent there so she could continue at least getting medical assistance there. After the internment camp, some of the sisters returned to the United States but some were very eager to return to Hankailu and the other missions that we had set up. When, this would have been like in the late 40s, the communists took over. The Japanese were booted out. Communists, I believe, were people that the sisters feared maybe even more than the Japanese. And the, uh, the communists started in the northern part of China, and they just kept sweeping down, uh, coming south. And I know there's a couple of places where our sisters took in, sisters from other congregations, because their mission, their property, was overtaken by the communists. Our sisters waited till almost the very end. Mother B Bartholomew Frederick at the time had to send a telegram saying, come home now. Their way of getting out was starting to close up. Uh, they did manage to get out at the, in the last second. They were able to leave China and return home safely. But what's interesting, a number of our Chinese sisters entered while well, our sisters were in China. And here's a list of all the women that entered. And like I said, some did re come home with the Americans. Some others were not admitted because of, of illness um, or other reasons. But what happened when the communists came and they finally said we need to leave or they were told that they need to come home, they gave the novices and postulants a small amount of money and they were told go mix in with the locals. Um, again, the fear of if they were caught, they could be imprisoned maybe even put to death, because at that point all foreign missionaries were being booted out of China. They didn't want any foreigners. So some of these women, yes, are, are still alive. Um, some women ha did just mix into the, into the local um, people at the time. Some, I'm guessing, never got to go back to see their family. If the communists took over, they could have maybe been killed. And I also have a hunch that if a woman entered a convent, that might have been um, like a taboo in the family. So maybe she might not have been welcomed back to the family. So for some of these women, we don't know where they ended up. Okay. So for leaving in America, June 26, 1948 was the, the time that they left Hunkalu in a large plane. They were taken to the coast of China and near Shanghai and then in small groups they were able to obtain tickets, ship tickets, to get back to America. So they didn't come back all together, little you know, groups here and there. But once they did come, we have a picture of them returning. These are all the Chinese sisters that did come. One exception to sending the young women back into their, to the mix of the Chinese people was Sister Phyllis Shang. And she was an orphan and our sisters took her in. They noticed her keen um, talent for music, so they made sure that she came to America with them. So she was the one exception to um, not staying behind. And in time, in 1967, here is a photo of five of our Chinese sisters becoming Americans. Besides all the letters that were saved and chronicles in our directory, 
Two of our sisters also wrote books. Now, Sister Servatia's family put together her letters. So this is a story of her time in China. So this is very helpful to read. Then Sister Julian, who was an Anglican missionary who joined us while in China, she wrote this book, Franciscans, Tangzhong, China. And this too was very valuable information. So it's like full circle. And some of these Chinese sisters never got back to China. Um, some did, again, after the, the communist party allowed it to happen. Um, some found out that their family were all gone. Some found out that maybe there were one or two family members. Again, so when they came to America, they probably thought we'll never back, get back home to China. Just like our early missionaries thought they would never get back to America. So both ends sacrificed. The Chinese sisters, like I said, sacrifice land, homeland, and family. And we have five remaining. One is in Taiwan in a nursing home, and the other four are here in our mother house in Clark Hall. So all of this is in honor of, of them. Amen. <laughs>